At Guitar by Masters, we understand the importance of correct practice. That's why we use our patented interactive platform, PracticePal, to give you a unique opportunity to improve your guitar playing. Are you starting to learn the guitar, trying to improve your skills, or interested in learning new pieces? Guitar by Masters lets you do all that with some of the greatest guitarists, teachers, and composers of our time. Access an expanding library of tutorials for different guitar styles and levels, which come with interactive scores, detailed views of both hands, tips and comments from teachers available in multiple languages, virtual call and response settings, and other useful features to make your practice sessions more efficient and enjoyable. Learning from the masters has never been easier. Start your free trial today at guitarbymasters.com. Welcome to Guitar by Masters podcast. I'm your host, Carmen Steindler, and in this podcast, we'll be delving into numerous guitar topics, as well as having conversations with world's most renowned classical guitarists. My guest today is William Kanangeiser, one of America's finest classical guitarists. He's a founding member of the Grammy award-winning Los Angeles Guitar Quartet, an innovative concert and recording artist, as well as a professor at the USC Thornton School of Music in Los Angeles, where he's been a member of the guitar faculty for almost 40 years. Welcome, William, and thank you very much for joining us today. Carmen, it's such a pleasure. So let's maybe start at the very beginning. Um, if I understood this right, your guitar beginnings were quite coincidental in the sense that you kind of stumbled onto it because of your brother, then very soon realized that you actually excel at it, and later on landed in the guitar class of Pepe Romero, one of the most prominent virtuosos in the history of classical guitar. So please tell our listeners a bit about this very interesting journey of yours. Well, you know, I, I was about nine years old and I was the youngest of, of three boys and my older brothers had friends who played guitar um, and I was just fascinated with it. And the music that I was listening to at that time was what was popular in America at that time. You know, a lot of folk guitar, James Taylor, Joni Mitchell, the Beatles, you know, stuff like that. And my the middle brother, he got a guitar and he wanted to learn it but he wouldn't let me, he wouldn't let me have it. And, and he was working with this book. I think it was the Mel Bay, you know, beginning guitar book. And after about a month, he finally was like, okay, Bill, you can, you can check it out. And, and in about two days, I went farther in the book than he had gone in a month. And then he was like, just take the guitar, you know, you know? So um, I obviously had a, an aptitude for it, but also, some of my brother's friends showed me some pieces. And so some of the first things I learned how to play was, I remember one of the first like pieces I learned was the introduction to Blackbird by the Beatles, you know, and, and I figured that one out, you know, and, and, um, and then this little lick from a James Taylor tune, you know, from fire and rain, you know, I was like, wow, you know, <laughs> but there was a lot of music in my house. We, no, no one else was a musician, but my, my father was a real music lover and he had a, a Segovia record. It was the old Castles of Spain recording of Segovia. And I remember being just fascinated with that, you know, listening to some of those beautiful Torrobo pieces. Um, but I didn't think of myself as necessarily becoming a classical musician at that time. I was when I was in high school, I, I was playing, you know, kind of rock and roll. I was really into especially the, the group called Yes. Um, you know, I was really into that kind of, you know, classical rock stuff. Um, and I, you know, I played a little jazz, you know, I played, a, you know, a few different things, but, but I, I studied classical a little bit, but I sort of luckily happened to come to USC, you know, not, not even really knowing who Pepe Romero was. Uh, you know, I, I went to USC mostly because they were one of the few schools at that time that had classical and pop guitar. And I wanted to do a little of both. When I got there, I realized, wow, this Pepe guy is amazing. <laughs> and also, I'm not as good at pop guitar as I thought I was. <laughs> you know, the other guys are a little better. 
So I really focused on the classical. But the interesting thing is, years later, in, especially in the quartet, but also in my solo music, my interest and experience with different styles, with you know jazz and rock and country and flamenco and you know blues and world music, it all came to be part of my musical expression. You know, so I think if I had just been a classical guy who only played, you know, Soar and, and Bach and, you know, the and the classics, it, I maybe wouldn't have, you know, flourished as much as I have. And actually, these influences um, are very prominent on the album that got you the Grammy as LA GQ, right? The Guitar Heroes. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's really Yeah, that was a that was a that project was really a culmination or, you know, labor of love about all of the music and artists who really inspired us when we were growing up. Um, and, you know, when we talk about the quartet, you know, you know, Pepe and the Romeros were our model. You know, they were our, you know, I mean, for me, Pepe is, you know, the example of what an artist can be. You know, he has his solo career, his, his quartet. Um, but I still remember Pepe, giving me a lesson when I was just starting out and, and he said, basically, you cannot be the second best Pepe Romero. You have to be the best Bill Kadengeiser, <laughs> you know, which it, it was really interesting for him to say and really, you know, shows what a great teacher he was. He, he didn't want us to completely copy him. He wanted us to learn from him, but to also discover our own voice and the Romeros grew up in Spain, listening to opera. You know, they weren't exposed to, to the Beatles, <laughs> you know, and Jimi Hendrix. And we grew up in, a, in the United States. And so our, our, you know, DNA, our musical DNA is different. And, and so that's, that's what we explored. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. But yeah, of course, you're absolutely, absolutely right. Cool. Okay, next one, next topic, LAGQ. You are the founding member of the Grammy award-winning Los Angeles Guitar Quartet. That needs no introduction at this point. <laughs> I actually remember attending your concert in Darmstadt, Germany, some eight or 10 years ago, and just being completely fascinated by, by the experience. This was definitely one of the most memorable guitar concerts I have ever been to. So my question is, um, after more than 40 years of playing together, after 14 album releases and thousands of concerts all over the globe, how is the dynamic within the quartet and how has it maybe developed throughout the decades? It's, it's really interesting. You know, you know, it's unusual that a group like ours has you know, stayed together this long and that we've had as few membership changes over the years that we've had. Uh, we've only had, you know, John and Scott and I are original members. We've been the whole time. And then we've only had, you know, three people sitting in the third chair, as we call it. Um, and one one thing that was really kind of a beautiful culmination or celebration of this was um, last June, we were given an honor from the Guitar Foundation of America. We got a, a Hall of Fame award from them. And we did a concert as it was part of the, the festival. Um, even though the, the rest of the festival was online, our concert was in person. And uh, Pepe presented us with, with the award. But what was really beautiful about it was Anissa Angarola, the original member for 10 years, and Andrew York, you know, the second member for 16 years, were there as well. And so they, they presented it to the L.A. guitar sextet, you know, it, you know, that it was the, the six members who, you know, in fact, I can show you if you hold on one second. That's so lovely. Though. They did it this way. <laughs> yeah. So this is the uh, this was the the, you know, uh -huh. the, the soundboard magazine with that. But but they gave us oh, this thing weighs a ton. <clears throat> they gave us this this award okay. and uh and it and it lists all six of us you know that's, that's um, beautiful you know so you know the thing is you know the, when i think about the quartet it you know we're a music group you know we're you know 
and all that. But but we're almost more like a little family. Um, you know, like John and Scott and I really are sort of like brothers. Um, and just like any family, you know, we have, you know, this great connection. We also have like things that really bother us about each other, you know, and, and oh, why is he like that? Ugh. You know, and, and, you know, and we have our own distinct roles and, and, um, and especially now with Matt Greif, you know, he's been, he's what he's, we call him the new guy cause he's only been with us for 16 years, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I like to think of Matt as being, it's like, we're the three brothers and then he's our nephew. You know, and and like he's like, hey, you guys are great. You know, like, you know, there's no emotional baggage at all, you know, like and he's he's just so easy to work with. And um, but, you know, we're still we're still doing it. You know, in fact, I'm, I'm leaving this afternoon to fly to Detroit and we, we've got a gig together, you know, and and um, so, you know, we're st we're still doing it. You know, it's it's kind of crazy. And, and we we did just release a new album. Uh, do I have it here? Two months oh, ago, no, right? I don't have Very it. recent. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I had. I, I popped it in my suitcase already. I, I will put um, it on the like a photo of it on the video. Oh wait. Version. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. You have that. The opalescent. Yeah. Well, actually, exactly. I want to show. I want to show this to you because I know I'm ta I'm going crazy here. Do it. Here. Do it. Do Hold it. Take on your one time. second. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm kind of proud of this. We we. This is our second self-released uh, project. So this is Opalescent. Such nice um, artwork. Well, that's the thing I'm very proud of. My daughter is a virtual reality uh, artist. Oh. And so she created this opal on the computer. What? And, and then the, the, this is another opal, you know, the, um, on the CD. And then underneath it is a third opal. Let me take it wow. Off. Oh my goodness. It's that that blue wow. opal. Yeah, and so we got to work on that together and the the thing is it's inspired by a piece by Phil Houghton from Australia. He's a composer who passed away a few years ago and it's the piece is called Opals and there's there's three movements and so this is the white opal, the black opal and the water opal. So it's it's kind of a fun project and you know we we we're, I'm pretty proud of this. I actually was co-producer of this. I worked a lot on it. <laughs> oh, so. perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Have you worked with this composer before? Well, I, we were very lucky to, to get to know him. When I played solo there, he came to my concert. And um, there's actually a picture in the, in the liner notes here of us when we met him in Sydney. And, and he, I don't know if you can see this. It's a little hard. Well, you, you, you're going to see oh, yeah, this. But see th mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. there we are with, with Phil and he's got, he's holding the opal that, that inspired his piece. Oh, cool. And uh, so we got to work, you know, he's such a, he was such a wonderful guy. Yeah. yeah. So that's, there's, that's kind of fun. There's quite some uh, Australian composers that write very interesting things for the quartet. In our quartet, oh, yeah. we have an Australian, Stephanie Jones. And because of that, we've also been delving into Australian music quite a lot. Uh, and it's yeah, it's yeah. always a cool experience for sure. Cool, fantastic! Congratulations yeah. on the new release, fourteenth, right? CD of the LAGQ. I, I lost count. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. don't know anymore. After ten, yeah. everything is the same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any unusual incidents during your travels? Like maybe some interesting stories? For sure. I mean, so many oh, wow. concerts you had. <laughs> There's so many. There's so many. The f the thing is, we always we always go back to the one of the very first tours we ever did when we were. It was actually before we were even the Los Angeles Guitar Quartet. We were still the USC Guitar Quartet. We mm -hmm. were students, and we did a tour in Mexico. It was sponsored by the Education Department, and so we had to play like fifty school concerts. Some some of the concerts were like traditional concerts, but a lot of them were just playing for kids at schools and things like that. And 50 concerts in like 30 days, you know, wow. so we were going all over. But all of the things that happened on that tour are the best stories. And I, and I think 
I, I have told this story a few times, so I guess I can tell it again. Um, that we were in the Yucatan, in the, this beautiful part of, of Mexico, and we had a, f a free afternoon before a concert, and we went to visit one of the ancient Mayan temples, mm -hmm. this incredible place called Uxmal. Um, and so we, our driver brought us there, and we, were, we climbed to the top of this temple, and, and we're looking down, and we can see the driver, and he's sort of running to the van. <laughs> and we're like, what's going on? And we see this line of clouds coming. It was like, like, and before we could even like react, it was raining as hard as it's ever rained. Like, and just, just like standing in the shower and we're like climbing down the, 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 the pyramid, you know, and we jump into the van and we're just soaking wet. And we had to play that afternoon at a school, but we were nowhere near our hotel. So we couldn't change our clothes. And so we, we, like the three boys, we actually took our shirts off and we hung them up in the back of the van to try to dry them off. And we go to this little town and we're trying to find like a clothing store. We could buy some clothes and, and we're driving through this little town, but, but all the stores were closed because it was siesta. And, and so we, we, we pull up and these two tiny little Mayan women are there. And I lean out the window and we're, you know, we, we don't have any shirts on. <laughs> I lean out the window and in Spanish, I, I, I basically ask, you know, is there a store where we can buy some clothes? And they just look up at, at me and just start laughing, you know, because they thought we were naked, you know. <laughs> it was like... And so we ended up um, actually our, my my shirt dried out enough, but Scott, he had to wear a a garbage bag. He, he he found a garbage bag and he cut holes in the side and he put it on like a poncho. No. And he wore the garbage bag because he didn't want to mess up his guitar. So that so that was one of the good one of the good stories. Yeah. That's really, really, really fun. Okay. And you learned Spanish in those five weeks, right? Como no. Yeah. Perfecto. Es, es que, you know, pa para mí español es, es mi es mi lengua segunda, más o menos. Pero yo no, yo no puedo hablar you know, muy, muy bien. You know, <laughs> hay que <No>. practicar. <laughs> perfectamente, hablase perfectamente. But it's, it's better than my Slovenian. For sure. Better than anyone's Slovenian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, wonderful, wonderful. What a cool story. So the next topic I wanted to cover is the future of the classical guitar. I love this quote I found in an old interview of yours. And I wonder what you think of it today. The guitar is a universal instrument. That sounds kind of trite, but it can play music from almost any culture, almost any style, almost any form. It has so much range. That's the thing that's going to carry the guitar to the next century. It's when we limit it and when we pigeonhole it, put it into one little box, that it becomes boring. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with that. I, I like that. Nothing changed. Um, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's, it's interesting because I, I just did, you know, I just did a little solo tour. Uh, I played it in Cleveland and then I was supposed to play in Washington, D.C., but I got COVID and so it's postponed. <laughs> I'm feeling great now. Um, Very good. But my program was basically an example of exactly that. So my, my solo program, I called it Global Guitar, and it was comprised of a number of works that I actually commissioned. Um, I, I got a grant from the Augustine Foundation about five years ago and commissioned seven composers to write pieces in a project I called the, the Diaspora Project. And the whole idea was to ask composers about their their musical reaction to the, the subject of migration, you know, uh, refugees, you know, cultures that spread around the globe. And so my program was folk music through all over the world. And some were, were traditional pieces. I did the Fantasia Sevillana by Torrina. I did the English Suite by John Duart. But then I, I did a commissioned piece by a wonderful composer, Golfam Khayyam from Iran, a piece she wrote called Lost Land. It's just a gorgeous piece. I did a work by my friend Brian Johansson that's based on, it's called The Bootlegger's Tale, 
and it's based on Irish Celtic music, but also kind of American Appalachian music. You know, it's got like banjo licks in it and stuff and Irish fiddle tunes. I did the world premiere of a new piece by a woman named Andrea Clearfield, uh, a piece called Reflections on the Dranyan, which is actually the set piece for the GFA competition this year. And it's inspired by music from Tibet. Uh, she did field research into uh, court music from Tibet. And the Dranyan was, is the kind of Himalayan lute that is that, uh, from this place. Um, you know, I did also, you know, some Leo Brower Cuban stuff. And, and I did, of course, the Dushan Bogdanovich African sketches um, that I love. Uh, so the, the whole theme of, of the project or the, this program was here's, here's a classical guitar and it can imitate, you know, oh, oh and I'm sorry. And then I also played The Walls uh, by Sergio Assad, which, which was, is for guitar and, and guitar orchestra that, you know, has the Chinese wall and Hadrian's wall and Berlin wall and Middle East walls. And so in the course of that whole concert, I kind of said, well, the guitar, here's a guitar. It can be flamenco. It can be, you know, an English folk song. It can be a, a, a Persian uh, canon. It can be an oud. It can be a bagpipe. It can be a pipa. It can be a banjo. You know, it can be, you know, uh, a, a African kora. It can be all these different things. And, you know, the idea of the subtlety of nuance of, you know, the the kind of, you know, sound you get out of it can be modulated to imitate all these different instruments. To me, that's the beauty of the guitar. And I think, you know, there there is this, you know, sort of philosophy in classical guitar sometimes of, OK, here's the tone I want to get and here's the touch I want to get. And, you know, and. and sort of idealized for, okay, I'm going to play soar or I'm going to play Bach. And that's great. And, and we need to get that. But then it's like, well, how can you change it? How can you modulate it to explore all the potentials of the instrument? And I, I think for me, it's a, a little bit that I've always been fascinated with accents and dialects, you know, of speaking, you know, so I can, I, I gave you a little taste of my Pepe Romero before, you know, but, but, you know, I, I'm sort of good at imitating different accents. And even though politically, I'm not allowed to do it anymore, you know, because someone might get insulted. You are. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, but, but I do the same thing on the guitar. It's like, you know, if I'm going to be Tibetan, or I'm going to be Irish, or I'm going to be jazz, or, you know, or rock, you know, like, it, it changes and it, the, every all aspects of the technique change you know the kind of vibrato you use and the the, the kind of pluck and and this the sound you know and so that's the fascination for me and i think for audiences it does make it a just a, a little bit more ear opening experience yeah it does draw them in and kind of um yeah that's really really interesting so this is a great segue to what I wanted to mention next. One of the most important aspects of keeping the guitar repertoire fresh is also working with composers and commissioning new pieces. Recently, you've recorded three African sketches by the Serbian composer Dusan Bogdanovic, where he explores a variety of polyphonic and polyrhythmic ideas inspired by African music. How did you do that? Well, first of all, I've been a dear friend of, of Dushan for so many years and he's such an amazing composer in fact he's one of the composers that I commissioned for this diaspora project and that's that's a piece I'm going I'm going to work on soon but but I just wanted to let people know in case they when if they listen to that they thought wait that what was what was horribly wrong with his guitar it sounded so different and so what I did was I took you know these are just normal staples right um, and you take one staple and you just kind of bend the corners of it. So for the, uh, guitar by masters, uh, lesson on it, I, I used a little aid. I said, okay, here's a staple. Okay. You know, and then you just bend the corners of it like that. Right. So, um, so then you take that staple 
and you just you kind of squeeze two strings together like this. Oh. And and then the staple just connects. It's connecting the first and second string now, and so. Also use it in. A, I, I wrote a, a, a quartet piece that's just going to be published soon. I wrote it years ago for the quartet. It's this piece called Mbira. You know, so so to me that that sound of the the two strings connected, you know, kind of imitates the you know the almost distorted or or you know noisy wonderful sound of the the kora. Uh, the the African harp and nice and so time. just that idea of of using you know different things to attach to the strings um, is something you know that that I've used a lot. In fact, let me let me go get something else. This is more the extreme version of this. Years ago, I wrote a piece for the quartet that was inspired by Indonesian gamelan music. Okay, and uh, and so. I wanted to figure out well how can I make the guitar imitate um, you know a like a gamelan gong so I, I found these little it's a little alligator clip I don't know if you can see it it's a little oh, yeah, hard to see. see yeah whoop, oh, there, there it is yeah um, okay. and you clip it onto the string like so and then I pluck it over here and it goes Whoa, okay. <laughs> Pretty crazy, huh? You do lots you know, of then, such things with the quartet as well, right? Yeah, and I even like, you know, came up with this thing. It's like I made this little it's a little piece of plastic with a hole in it and it's connected to a little little Christmas bell. Oh wow. And and you put that on on the string and you get you get this. Uh, oh well, let me take. Wait, I gotta take the uh, the staple off. <laughs> yeah, don't <laughs> okay, do everything at the same time. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. You know, so you know, th there's ways. I mean, these are like the most extreme ways to modulate the sound. It's it's sort of cheating in a way, but, you know. But but this idea of you know, prepared guitar where you actually put something on the strings. But but I think, you know, we can also, you know, change the sound just by the nuance of the way you pluck. But, you know, the idea of working with composers is something I've, I've really been involved with for a while. And, you know, um, you know, working with Golfam Kayam on, you know, like the notation for her, she's an expert in Persian uh, ornamentation and improvisation and and you know like okay how do we write out this thing and and then working with Andrea Clearfield who isn't she's not a guitarist so she, we had to sort of you know figure out how to express what she wanted you know and um, be, both of those became very collaborative um, other composers like Brian Johansson he's so completely on top of everything he's so experienced he sent me the score it's like okay it's like good. It's good. <laughs> I think I changed like two fingerings, you know, it's just like ready to go, you know. Okay. So it, it depends on the composer and their, you know, their experience with the instrument. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it's such a big responsibility that we also have commissioning new pieces and just keeping the repertoire alive and, and just bigger every year yeah. and taking care of the future generations in a way. You know, so they have interesting yeah. pieces to play, pieces that captivate the audiences and that can bring the guitar into the, the next century now already. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. That's, that's how I feel about it. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's listen to the first African sketch.
quick note for our listeners, if you are interested in learning this piece, it is available on Guitar by Masters with a detailed and comprehensive analysis of the piece by William Kennengeiser. Okay, so let's continue. You've been a member of the guitar faculty at the UCS Thornton School of Music since 1983, as well as given masterclasses around the world. Your passionate and enthusiastic approach to teaching is well known, and a lot of our listeners have been learning from the collections you have released on Guitar by Masters. I was wondering how you approach teaching and what are your favorite practice tips? Well, you know, I love to teach. I don't know why I have that um, that feeling. I know some some people like they teach you know, because they sort of have to to pay the bills. I just love it. And for me, it's, it's, I, I'm not the kind of teacher who has like, okay, here's the series of things we're going to learn. This is my little formula. Everyone's going to do this. I, I'm, I've never been like that. I, I'm very improvisational and very reactive. And I think I got this from Pepe Romero. You know, I've seen him teach so many master classes over the years. And when Pepe is, when someone plays for Pepe, he just sort of empties himself and he, he looks, he looks at them and it's almost like he's looking through them, <laughs> you know, and listening with hundred percent attention. And he's able to just go right to exactly what they need to hear right then, you know, and it's, it's such an art, you know, and. And so I try to, you know, live up to his, his model and, and, you know, the thing I, I do like to delve into technique a lot, um, and not technique in the normal way of, okay, here, here's how you play fast scales, or here's how you, you know, here's how you play an arpeggio or a slur. I, I try to delve into the idea that Pepe's brought to me, which is how do you feel when you're playing? Like what, you know, what, what it, he always says this, it's like, does it feel good? Does it sound good? <laughs> you know? And he said, it should always be a joy to play all the time, you know? And I would say for most people, it's not a joy. It, it's pain. <laughs> you know? It's like, ah, you know, um, but I also really like to be in touch with what's going on musically, um, you know, relating what we're doing to the, the human voice, to the, to phrasing like a singer. Um, I think guitar players tend to focus so much on the attack of notes, the beginning of the note, because our instrument is a percussion instrument. Like we hit the note, pop, and the, the note dies. And I think because of that, a lot of guitar players like after they hit the note, their attention is gone, you know, and, and if you're bowing a note or, or, you know, playing a, a wind instrument or singing, you're, you're controlling the note all the way through. And I, I, so I think the connection between notes and the, and what happens after you hit a note is, is such an important thing. Um, and it's part of also my experience with the quartet, how, you know, we, we got pretty good at, you know, not just playing together, but cutting together, you know, like the articulation of notes. So these are all details of, of teaching that come up. Um, I don't have like, I have, I have lots of little studies and warm up techniques and, and, and little things that I give students, but I don't have like this set thing that I always do. It's, it's for me, it's in the middle of a lesson something will occur to me and it's like, oh, let's, let's isolate this little thing and repeat it. Or let's, you know, let's do it with the right hand by itself or let's, you know, so it, it's, it is pretty improvisational, I have to say. And, and for me, it's a sense of discovery with the student, you know, that we're, we're learning something together, you know, like fingering is a really good example. It's, it's like so many students, like, they, they get a piece of music and it's fingered and they're like, okay, that's how you play it. That's it's like, this is what I, this is how you do it. And, and, you know, very, sometimes the fingering that's there is the best fingering. Like if, if Dushan Bogdanovich fingered it, it's probably the best fingering. Um, but 
with lots of pieces. I'm like, well, why not? Why, we could play it here or you could do it there or you could do it. Well, you could, do, you know, and fingering becomes a big part of interpretation. Um, and, you know, and I think that's a that's a skill that requires not just, uh, you know, ideas, but it's also knowledge of the fretboard. Like like some students, they just default. They see an E, you know, they see this note and they just play it there. And it's like, well, you, geez, you can play that note there, or there, or there, or there, or there, or there, or there. You know, you can play it exactly seven different places on the instrument, you know, um, and then every possible permutation, you know, thereof. Um, so, you know, it's it's just one of those, you know, pedagogical ideas. Yeah, but this is also great that you approach every student very individually and just see what they need at a particular time. I think that's that's the way to go. As well as this topic that, that comes up a lot uh, in um, guitar discussions, which is not being a slave to your to the guitar technique, to the technique of the instrument, but rather expressing your true musical ideas and um, to kind of adapt your fingerings or articulation ju just to that and not, not to what you are able to do, but what you actually want to convey with the music that yeah. was written. Yeah. Well, and I would say, you know, the other, you know, major aesthetic I have as a performer and a teacher is, well, what's the message of the piece? What's the story of the piece? What's, you know, what's the sound world of the piece? And, you know, I, I like to have, the, certain pieces are especially conducive to having a narration. Um, this piece I mentioned by Brian Johansson, it's called The Bootlegger's Tale. It absolutely is a story. You know, it, 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 it's like, okay, here's the guys trying to make the whiskey and they're sad because it broke. Okay, here they are, they got, they got it working and they're drinking and they're having a great time. Okay, here they are and they're being chased by the, the, you know, the government people trying to arrest them. And then here they are running away. You know, it's like, and it's, it's a story. And Brian, you know, wrote it, you know, as a narrative. And to me, it helps. It, it gets you away from, you know, from the fingers into what am, what's the story here? Yeah. Playing music is definitely storytelling <laughs> in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Any particular practice tips you could share with our listeners? You know, I, I mean, there's so many things that one could say. You know, I, I would say that it's people seem to be so fixated, I think, on how much time they get in. And I'm a big believer in quality, not quantity. <laughs> you know, uh, if you practice for three hours straight and you're not paying attention and you're doing things wrong, you actually haven't improved. You've actually gone backwards, <laughs> you know. And if you practice for 30 minutes with great attention and focus and you're really doing things the right way, you, you're going to improve. And, and so I think it's, it's this mindful practice is the important thing. Or some people call it deep practice. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, you know, ideas, you know, like making sure your social media is turned off and you know, things like that. And, and, but I also, you know, really try to be aware of not just what I'm doing with my fingers, but how I feel like my whole body. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, these aren't really practice tips. They're, they're more ideas about wellness. This is the perfect segue to our next topic, which is wellness. I, I found our next topic especially fascinating and very much needed in the world of classical music. Um, in 2011, you co-founded the Thornton Wellness Committee and initiated a series of public forums on topics such as injury prevention and recovery, hearing protection, performance anxiety, music and mindfulness, and many others. So my question is, what sparked your interest in researching the physical, mental and spiritual health of musicians in particular? I've always been really fascinated with the physiology of, of, of the anatomy. My, my brother, my older brother is a physician. And I think I, you know, almost have like 
you know, this idea. So even when I was just a student, I, you know, Pepe thought it was really interesting, but I had like these diagrams of, you know, the tendons and the muscles and everything, you know, and, um, and it's always been a, a fascination with me, but I've gotten, you know, much more into it in the last decade or so. In fact, you know, you can see all these books back here. Almost all of them are, you know, have, have to do with some aspect of, of wellness, you know, for musicians. And, you know, being uh, on the faculty at USC, we realized that we were not really focusing on it enough um, for our students. And, and, you know, as a group, musicians are much more likely to have uh, what they call occupational injury, which is, you know, an injury based on what they're doing. We're also much more likely to have emotional problems, um, you know, based on what we're doing. And especially in, in pop music, you know, it's, you know, a substance abuse and suicidal tendencies and things like that. There's some really extreme things. Hearing protection. You know, there's there's some really serious threats to our longevity uh, as a musician. And, you know, Pepe, in a way, again, was my model here. here. He's like 78 years old. And he's touring the world, playing at the top level. He sounds just as great now as he did when he was 20 years old. And it's partly because he knows how to, how to take care of himself, you know, as a musician. And so it became a, a very big interest for me. And I, I actually ended up developing a course, uh, a two-unit intensive course um, that I've taught for six years now. And covering lots of topics that you, that you discussed. Um, a big thing that I'm interested in is is what they call somatic awareness. So there's this technique called Alexander technique, which has to do with being aware of you know head balance and position and fluidity and all that. You know, because you know a lot of guitar players, you know, they tie themselves into knots. Like they pick up the guitar and they're just like, you know. And, and then they wonder, look, why does my neck hurt? My back hurt? You know, it's like, gee, I don't know. Mm. You know? But it's also, it's, and it's not just musicians. I think there's a tendency right now in, in culture. You know, I see, you know, little kids with their phones and they're like, you know, they, they look like 80 year old people. You know, it's just like, you know, we, we need to, you know, be natural and be, you know, elegant and poised and relaxed as much as possible. And then, then we'll be able to do things, uh, in the, in the natural way. So it, it is, it's a, it's an interesting thing. There's a lot of facets to wellness, you know, um, but from a guitar standpoint, I think a lot of it is basically getting away from the idea that the technique stops right here. You know, mo most guitarists is like, okay, this is, here's my fingers. And that's, I put them in the place where they go. And that's what I do. And so it, it even, you know, from a guitar technique standpoint, it even has something to do with, you know, um, you know, moving the arms and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I think it should, these topics should be in the curriculum of every music university in the world. And hopefully it, it goes in this direction. Yeah. Okay. So I just have a one sub sub cue for this, uh, this question, which is, what are some routines you set in place for yourself in order to stay healthy? Wow, boy, now you're talking, now this is, a, you know, do what I say, not what I do, <laughs> you know, or, you know, you have to walk the walk, not just talk the talk, you know, so, um, you know, I, after, you know, telling people about wellness and how important it is, you know, I do sort of see, yeah, you know, if, if you don't exercise a little bit, you know, if you eat really bad, if, if you don't have good sleep habits, if you, you know, take a lot of drugs and, and drink too much, it's, it's not very good. You know, <laughs> it's gee, you know, I mean, the funny thing is it's, it is, it is a little bit of, um, common sense, you know, moderation, but I, I'd say that I've gotten better over the years in terms of, you know, I, I've always been sort of a, a healthy eater. You know, I, I love to cook, and so I know exactly what's going into what I'm eating, you know, and, you know, try to just eat. I'm not crazy, you know, fanatical about it, but I, I eat, try to eat healthy food and not too much, you know, 
you know, package things. And I, I really like to sleep. I think sleep is really important. Uh, I'm not a super exerciser, like, you know, weightlifting or anything, but I, I, you know, we just got a dog, you know, we have a puppy. And so that's keeping me very busy, you know, and, and keeping me active. Um, I've gotten a little bit more into mindfulness uh, and med- you know, and I, I'm not like a guru, <laughs> you know, but I do try to sit and do some light meditation. You know, I don't do it every day. I should, but you know, at least, you know, three or four times a week, I, I, I definitely will sit and do meditation. I real I know that a regular practice is even better for me. Um, uh, you know, these, all these things, you know, th- can help. I also feel like in, in presenting ideas about wellness to, to various people, it's, it's sort of like a menu of things like, like, here's all these things you can do to, you know, to, that are going to be helpful. You shouldn't try to do all of them. There's not enough time. And, and some people, you know, like I, I did yoga a long time ago and, and I just, I probably should do it, but I, there were some things about yoga I did not like, like I, I real like the whole downward dog thing where you have to bend your, your wrists way back like this. I was like, this feels, I, I just don't want to do that with my hands, you know? And, and so I just, I was not into it. And, um, I studied Alexander technique and there's this other thing called Feldenkrais. And and I I was Mm -hmm. like, I'm just not, the Feldenkrais doesn't do it for me. The Alexander really makes sense to, you know, and, you know, so, you know, there's this thing they, they say, you know, like, what's the best exercise in the world? And the answer is the one that you'll do, you know, and, and so, you know, you have to choose what, what, you know, what things work best for you. Um, but, you know, I think it, it, it also relates in a way to our emotional state, you know, that, that if you, if you feel healthy, you're, you're going to be happier, you're going to be less likely to have negative thoughts. We all have negative thoughts and we all um, are really hard on ourselves and we all tend to think dark thoughts and especially coming through the pandemic and all this horrible stuff happening just north of you right now. Um, you know, that the world is really challenging and, and thinking positive doesn't necessarily make those problems go away, but, but it helps you to deal with them. Helps you cope. And, yeah. um, yeah. And, and, you know, so I remember years ago, Pepe, someone asked Pepe, it's like, well, how, how do you deal with getting nervous and performance anxiety? And, and Pepe said, it's very easy to defeat performance anxiety. You just have to be happy all the time. So easy. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and he said, and it's so easy, but then he explained, he explained it and he said, that when he play, when he picks up the guitar, he has, he's so grateful for that this instrument even exists. Like the guitar exists and, and this piece I'm playing, someone, this guy wrote it and I'm, and I have the talent and the, you know, training to play it. And for him, it's like, and my own son built this guitar, you know, you know, and, and so he's just got overwhelming amount of gratitude and like, oh my God, like, like life is so great, you know? And, and then, so every note he hits, it's like, oh, and, and does it feel good? Does it sound good? And, you know, and it's, it's a whole different way of approaching it. And as opposed to, you know, our normal mindset, which is you pick up the guitar and before you even play a note, you're like, oh God, you know, and you start playing. It's like, no, that's wrong. Oh, that's, you know, and, and you, you build in, in a way you build in trauma, you know, you build in negative thoughts of, of low (laughs) self-esteem, you know, to every note, you know, and, and so Pepe's answer is no, you have to build in gratitude and, and sharing and happiness and beauty in every note, you know, and it, it's a really interesting way, you know, and, and so it's a form of mindfulness, really, um, you know, mindfulness doesn't necessarily mean sitting on a cushion, you know, that's meditation. Mindfulness is just the definition of mindfulness is to be 
in the present moment with attention and without judgment. So it's like, I'm just, I'm here and I'm experiencing what I'm experiencing. And I'm not saying that it's good or bad or, and I'm, I'm not thinking about the past or the future. I'm just experiencing. And you could say that music is, is a mindful activity because the, the music is going the whole time. It's in the present. It's always in the present. And when we play, how much, how much are we in the present? Very little, you know, well, sometimes, you know, oh, here comes that hard thing coming up, you know, you're thinking about, or, oh God, I, how could I have made that mistake? Oh, my mistake was terrible. You know, you're still playing. So learning to be in the present and just accepting it, it it's, it's so easy, but it's so difficult. Mm. And the best um, concerts and practice sessions, I feel, are always the ones where you completely forget about the time because you're so immersed in what you do at the at the very moment. It's yeah, it's what mindfulness that's called, is. That's called flow. That's yeah. called the flow state. Exactly. You know, yeah. where where you it just happens. You lose sense of time. There's no effort. You know, that's what we. That's that's the the experience we all want, you know, and I've, I've had like brief moments of that, you know, in my life, you know, brief. And it's marvelous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the next time you go, I want it again. And then, nope. No, no, no. It's not flowing. <laughs> it's not flowing. Yeah, we're nope. always chasing it. And, and the more we succeed, the, the better. But yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> it's a, it's life. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Uh, let's continue with some more music. The next piece we'll be hearing is called Sueño, which means sleep or dream. This recording is a part of a collection of five Francisco Tarrega favorites, Sueño, Marieta, Adelita, Mazurka and Sol, and Maria. And in this valuable collection, William goes through every detail to help you make them sound great. So here is Sueño by Tarrega. <laughs> Especially in the light of the recent pandemic, online learning is slowly becoming a norm. Where do you think Guitar by Masters stands here? And what is your experience with online teaching? You know, I hadn't done very much remote teaching at all before the pandemic, but at my school, we were sort of ahead of the curve. Like we were doing Zoom about, about a month before everybody else. Um, so we kind of learned about it a little bit. Um, and with some exceptions, I was really surprised at how effective this, this could be. Um, in some ways, there were some times where, you know, if I was in the studio at school, you know, I would say, oh yeah, you know, I have this piece at home 
you know, I'll bring it in next week. And, and you know, and then I'm at Zoom. I say, like, wait a minute, I got it right here. You know, <laughs> or let's look it up online. Here it is, you know. Very handy. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I got pretty good at, you know, like having like m multiple cameras and being able to show things. And we even got at USC, we, we, for a while, we were using a different program than Zoom for private lessons. It was called MF Classroom, which has not very good video, but really good audio. Um, so you could really hear the students. Um, and the things that don't work online is to, to file someone's nails. That doesn't work. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, it doesn't work. Um, but the, the, the big thing that didn't work was guitar ensemble, you know, because of the latency, the delay. Um, and that was really frustrating. But I, I did get pretty good over the time of learning how to do, uh, you know, multi-track recording and video editing. Um, and I, so with my USC guitar orchestra, you know, we did a number of projects where, you know, I basically recorded all four parts and then videoed myself conducting and then sent it to all the students and then they re videoed themselves. You know, it's kind of like the virtual guitar orchestra thing. Um, and then I got it and I made comments and then they sent them back and I got it and I aligned it on Pro Tools and then I put it together on, uh, you know, I learned how to use Premiere Pro and do video editing. And it's not super professional like the virtual guitar orchestra guys, but but pretty, pretty good, you know, good enough for our presentations. And even though it was not a real ensemble experience for them <laughs> it's it's not the same as being in the room and listening they learned a lot you know about uh about ensemble and also to some extent in a guitar orchestra it it was good because they couldn't hide in the back of the room you know like a lot of guitar orchestra rooms. <laughs> you know because it's like bill's gonna hear you playing your part by yourself you know so um but it was really nice when we could finally come back in the same room. I, I, I told everybody the first day, it's like everyone's going to hit an E major chord. Just go, from and go, yeah. You know, I'm hearing that in the air, not through these crappy, you know, speakers. And by the way, your third string is flat. You know, <laughs> like that was the other thing, you know. And, and yeah. you know. Um, but, you know, the idea of... of online lessons has been around for a long time um you know and and you know when i first started working with hossein um and and guitar by masters i thought this is a really cool idea it was it was really through dushan bogdanovich that i found out about it um and he was very interested in it um that's why i i did the african sketches first um you know th as as you guys know there, there's a number of different uh, you know, things like this online, but, but Guitar by Masters has this pretty unique, uh, you know, delivery system. Very interactive. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I, you know, they were very kind. They sent me, you know, some cameras and some, you know, lighting things taught me, you know, a little bit how to make decent looking videos. Mine, mine look okay. They don't look nearly as good as Stephanie's. Stephanie's <laughs> the master of it. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, it always is tricky to do a lesson on a piece when you don't know who the, the student is, <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, when I talked before about giving private lessons, you know, there's the student, they're playing for me and it's like, oh, they need to hear this. Well, if I'm doing a lesson, it's like, I don't know what their experience is, their level, I can't hear them, you know, so then you have to think about it, okay, what, what's my philosophy on this and how am I going to present it? Um, and with, you know, I, I need, I'm going to do more uh, selections, but, but it, it was pretty fun for me to like figure out, okay, what do I want to focus on with these? And, and here's, oh, let's talk about how you do a slide, you know, like a certain way or, you know, how, or bringing out this voice, you know, like, well, what, what's the thing he's going for there, you know, and, and what's this rhythm, you know, like, how do, how do we do that, you know, and, and so I, I feel pretty responsible in these lessons to have like very specific, you know, kind of understandable ideas with each of the, le the mini lessons. Um, 
you know, because if people are going to watch the lessons, you want it to be deep enough that they can return to it and, and you know, go back and, and you know, refine their playing with it. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, and, and you're right. Yeah, you have to just take a different approach when you don't know who the student actually is. But yeah, right. great. Yeah. Okay, last question before uh, we get to the questions of our subscribers, which is... Yeah. How do you keep organized and find balance amidst all the numerous projects you're involved in and having to travel all over the globe? Do you have any free time at all? Yeah, you could ask my wife, how do I keep organized? And she'll say, he doesn't. He doesn't. You know, uh, uh, it's interesting. You know, um, I don't think of myself as being like an incredibly organized person but somehow I'm able to keep everything going. Um, I do tend to be a compartmentalizer. In other words, like when I work on one thing, I just kind of work on this one thing and I'll, I'll let other things go. <laughs> and I've been lucky enough that, you know, I, when I get back to them that, <laughs> that I'm not in trouble. Um, I mean, that, that's even in the last year, that's happened a lot. I had like this big recording project I did with a string quartet and I completely let my solo project, my solo program go. And then when I finished that, you know, I started really working on the solo project. And, and the whole time, you know, I'm, you know, doing teaching at USC and whatever the quartet's doing. I spent a lot of time over the fall working on production of this thing of <laughs> a lot of times you see you see the you see the booklet who wrote the program notes not the new guy Nobody, from the nope. court <laughs> well he's the most likely to do it he's oh, the okay. most likely to do it the most interesting john and scott who are yeah anyway um and then there's you know family you know like my my wife and my my daughter you know and her her uh, her partner and and the dog. The dog. The dog. What kind of a dog do you have? You want to see him? Yes, yes, please. I love dogs. Hold, hold like on. In, in the episode we, we did with Stephanie, we put photos of her dog and videos at the end. Oh of no, the this episode, is going to so. be much better. Hold on one second. Oh my goodness, there will be a dog. <laughs> my it's heart. Mr. Darcy. It's Mr. Darcy. Mr. Darcy, what a happy dog! Mr. He's so cute. Dar my my wife is a big Jane Austen fan, so yeah, that makes sense. How old so is he? So that's Mr. He's just about nine months old. He's just a puppy. He's just a puppy. What a cutie! Yeah, wow. what an honor so to meet great. him. <laughs> oh, he's great. So this is a big part of the happiness quotient here, the wellness quotient. Yes. Yeah, definitely. because uh, here, let me put him down. Dogs are just just so incredible, so incredible. You know, so I guess you know it's part of like balance, right? You know, it's a little bit of balance. Um, you know, I you know, I could I could reference something which I I, I think people should check out if they're interested. There's this fantastic film uh, documentary that's basically about performance anxiety. And it's called Composed, the documentary, mm -hmm. Composed. And it's on, I think it's on Vimeo. And uh, they interview all these people, you know, professionals and students and stuff. And, and, you know, basically it's, you know, how do we, you know, how do we deal with performance anxiety? And this one guy, he's like concert master of, you know, the LA Phil or something. And he goes, you know... Uh, playing violin is something I do, but it's not who I am. Exactly. And and it's and it's, you know it's something I love, and I've you know, but but and it's a really interesting thing because we tend to identify ourselves so much with with it that you know if we don't play well <laughs> for some reason, or we don't think we play well, that we don't feel like we have no value as a person, and and. You know, you want to do the best you can, but it's it's just one part of you. And it's actually counterproductive because it brings this pressure that that actually um, prevents you from from being a good musician. At the end, if you identify yourself with what you do, it's what how you said. It's it's yeah. just what you do, but not who who you actually are. 
yeah and mindfulness practices yeah. um, really help with that i feel as well yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure to finish off here is a few questions by the guitar by masters podcast listeners we always post a question box on our instagram and facebook stories a few days ahead of recording these podcasts so stay tuned and your question just might get asked in our next episode so the first question what is your advice for young aspiring classical guitarists who want to establish themselves on the international concert scene? So the first thing is you definitely have to subscribe to Guitar by Masters. I mean, that's for sure. You know, um, you know, I'm so lucky with the, the students I have at USC. I've already, you know, we already have some students who are established on the international scene. You know, Mark Gergic, um, Bo Kyung Byun, um, who just won the GFA. Um, we have uh, Mircea Gorgonchia. We have uh, T.Y. Zhang, who won the GFA a few years ago. And I, I also worked with, with uh, Vladimir Gorbash. You know, so I, I've been very lucky to, you know, work with some incredible students who are, are making it. Um, it's, it's hard to establish yourself. And... Um, but in a way, it's it's easier now than it used to be years ago. Because in the old days, you know, the only way anyone would know about you is if you somehow got a record company to to sign you, and you only and you got a manager to sign you, and you know, you get a concert and you you know have someone give you a review. Whereas now, anybody sitting in their house can make a video and put it up on Instagram or YouTube and, you know, go viral. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how things are now. And th the thing is, I'm not from that world and, and I'm terrible at social <laughs> media. In fact, I need to hire someone to help me because I'm just terrible at it. My, my student T.Y. Zhang is a master of it. He's <laughs> so good and he does really great looking videos. You know, he's really like, learned how to how to make them look right the right length and this fun little you know you know clips coming in it's so great um but i'm just totally dysfunctional i can't figure out how to make it work um so my advice though i still remember many many years ago i had just won my first major competition it was the toronto competition in 1981 and i i called manuel barueco because I, I, I knew him, you know, I had studied with him a little bit in a master class. And I called him up. I said, I just won this competition. Like, what, what should I do? You know, should I try to get a manager? And, he's, and he goes, work on your play. Just work on your play. <laughs> just, and I said, but what about work on your play? You know, and, and so it was like, oh, <laughs> I guess I'm not ready. <laughs> you know, but, but his advice was get really good. Get really good. Um, there's no single way to make a career. Uh, you know, I mean, for me, it's all about, I just follow what is interesting to me. You know, I follow my passion and I try to find what my own distinctive contribution is, you know, and I, I feel like if, if, if you're a nice person to deal with and you, uh, offer something that's different and unusual and fun or interesting, the, the opportunities will come to you. Uh, so it, you know, there's lots of examples of people who deserve to be really well known and they're not because they don't know how to, to be ambitious or they don't know how to present themselves. And then there's some people who are maybe not so great, but they're so good at it mm. that, and, and that's, you know, the, you know, it's like, is there justice in the world? You know, but, but, you know, I look at my idols, you know, I look at, you know, Pepe, I look at David Russell and the Assads and, you know, and, and, and why is David Russell so popular? Why is he so successful? Because he's just so good and he's such a nice person and he's so generous and it's just, it's just delightful to meet him and it's delightful to hear him. And so I, I want to, I want to pay money to see him. You know, it's that if you can be that way where people are just like, I really want to hear this guy, you know, 
And I think audiences also know if, if like, if the motivation is the artist is like, I want you to like me. I want you to be impressed by me versus here's this beautiful thing, you know, that I want to share with you. And yeah, the audience just yeah. gets drawn in. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I agree. I agree. Okay, the next question. What's the next collection you're releasing on Guitar by Masters? Very good question. In fact, everyone at the staff of Guitar by Masters wants to know that. I think the plan right now, you know, there, there was this list of, you know, high level unknown works that we wanted to do. And, you know, like, for instance, The Lost Land by Golfam Khayyam, this incredible piece. Also, this piece I commissioned from Dushan called The Castle in Cloudland, which is really hard. And I think I will do those, but I, I think the the demand for those is pretty low, you know, because how many people need to learn how to play that piece, even though there's really interesting things to work on. I think the, the, the feeling now is is to focus on shorter, easier, well-known uh, pieces like studies that really get deep into technique and I've always you know the first the first guitar book I ever bought like the first guitar music book was the Segovia collection of 20 studies by Soar and that was like the thing that started me and so for me that's like the you know the bread and butter of, of guitar and I know that a number of other Guitar by Masters people have 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 done some of them. I think Dennis Azerbajic and also um, uh, Edson Lopes has Lopez has. I, done I also some. did a but collection of sort did, of eight tunes. Yes. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> no, but I mean, there's so many. Just just do it. I know. Definitely. <laughs> well, I don't want to. I'm sorry. I, I didn't want to mess up. You you know your thing. Which ones did you do? Um, I did some of. Oh, oh, I don't remember. Opus six and Opus thirty five. Some of them. Three from Opus five. Uh, three. Uh, two from Opus six. Like okay. five sort of etudes. Yeah. The 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 funny thing is, you know, like there's like that's the correct way to refer to them. But for me, there it's the Segovia numbers are one through twenty, and which has nothing to do with the Opus Anything. numbers. You know, it's just like oh, number five is B minor. You know, you know. You know, so I might do those, but you know, maybe maybe it's been over over saturated. I'll, I'm I'm gonna see. I'm gonna no, see. But, but I also feel in guitar by masters they appreciate different different views. You know, on on the same etudes, they they already also have many recordings of Adelita, but you can learn many different things from different teachers. So it's it's always a valuable thing to have. Good, good. Okay, so I don't feel bad about it. But <laughs> the other thing we talked about very recently, which I think is is really good, is is to not do a lesson on a particular set of pieces, but to, to do something on essentially on wellness. But, but I think we're going to call it something like healthy hands and, and talk about, you know, biomechanics a little bit, talk about posture, talk about, um, you know, all these various things that I've, I've been, you know, uh, you know, referring to about, you know, ease of playing, you know, balanced position, um, you know, and, and other aspects of wellness. So I, I think that's what we're going to try to do next. That's Something an amazing that's a idea. A little more, a little more general, you know, and, and theoretically, like anybody could get something out of it because it's not about this one particular piece. Uh, so I think that's, that's the first thing they really want me to do. So I'm going to start planning that for this summer. That's an incredible idea. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Okay, so pre-last question. Where does your fascination with Don Quixote by Cervantes comes from? Okay, hold on. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know, but it's 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 pretty extreme. I've got I got a whole collection of of Quixotes up there. Um, I mean, you know, if you're a guitar player, you should have read Don Quixote. Um, you know, it's it's the essence of Spain. Um, it's th there's so much you could say about this book, which was written uh, in 1605, part one, and 1615, the second book. The first the first modern novel uh 
it's unbelievably funny. It's mm -hmm. unbelievably uh, sad. It's a portrait of madness, you know, mental illness, but it's also a, a, a surrealistic idea. I mean, you know, there's so many things in it that are amazing. Like, you know, one thing is in the second book, Sancho and, and Quixote are going around and they meet this, this, this guy and he says, Hey, wait, are, aren't you Don Quixote? And aren't you Sancho Panza? And, and Quixote says, how do you know who we are? He said, Oh, we read a book about you. And, 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 and Quixote says, there's a book about us. He goes, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's a great book. And all these great, uh, and then, and then Sancho says, is there going to be a second book? And the guy goes, I don't know. He said, well, if there is, the author better put in good adventures of me. And, and so it's like, it's like the, the character is telling the author how to write his book. You know, it's just like, and this was 1615. It's just like so amazing. So, I mean, the thing was, we, we, um, we met this very famous British actor named uh, John Cleese. In fact, let's see. Do I have he was in Harry Potter as well. So, well, he's been in everything, but he's from Harry Potter Monty fans. Python. Yes. So this oh, is when cool. we met him. This is John Cleese, and and um, many years ago, and he said, "Hey, let's do something together." And it's like, okay. <laughs> and then t he said, "Okay, in two years we're going to do this project," and it's like, "Well, what are we going to do?" And Scott came up with the idea of Don Quixote. And then I basically spent two years working on it. <laughs> and I, I, I adapted the novel into a th three act play um, and um, arranged 22 pieces from the Spanish Renaissance in the style. And then we ended up uh, with a different actor because uh, Cleese couldn't do it. He, we did it one performance with him, but then we toured it with this incredible guy wow. named Phil Proctor. And actually, my daughter did all the artwork on it, and when she was only fifteen. Wow. Um, and so, so um, it was like this, you know, stage production for narrator and for guitars, and it was like as if you're he's reading the book and you're going through the scenes. And I'm very proud of it. I think it's maybe the best thing I ever did. Um, and and we, you know, so that's available. I I think you know, um, but. I really got into the book when I was writing the right, you know, trying to ad adapt this 900 page book into a three act play, you know, like, well, what do you leave out? What do you, what, you know, what's the, f the structure of it? Yeah. That couldn't have um, been easy. Yeah. But it's, it's, you know, if you've never read it, th the only thing I would say about reading the book is, uh, is I, I, I haven't read it in the original Spanish. My Spanish isn't quite good enough. It's old Spanish too. Mm -hmm. But if you read it in English, I, I think it really depends what translation you use. Like this is the one I suggest uh, here. Actually, this was my copy of it, like with all the, you know, <laughs> with, you know, that I, I read like seven times. But well, this is uh, Edith, Edith Grossman's uh, version. Okay. This this translation is fantastic. Um, it, it really it makes it so modern and understandable some of the old old penguin classics versions of it are just so dry and it's really tough this is fantastic it's just cool. and i actually got to meet her i got to meet her got to work with her on the script um she came to our performance of it in new york and stuff so you know it's pretty cool cool thank you for the recommendation <laughs> I mean, what was good about this, too, was this got me outside of my little siloed world of classical guitar because, I, you know, I got to meet, you know, th this, you know, th this author and, you know, I learned how to do uh, a lighting plot <laughs> for the show. And I, I made the costume for the, <laughs> for the you know, and, and the, the, the stage pieces. Mm -hmm. And and then, I mean, for me, maybe the biggest thing is when I was in, when I was in high school, I spent when I wasn't playing guitar, I was fat. I was a fanatic of Monty Python and this other comedy group called Fire Sign Theater, which was kind of like an American Monty Python. Mm -hmm. And 30 years later, 
I was on stage with John Cleese from Monty Python and then toured it with Phil Proctor from Firesign Theater. So it's like kind of amazing that, you know, it brought me to, to share the stage with, with my two comic heroes. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, really good friends with Phil Proctor now. He's like one of my best friends. So what a dream come true. It's good. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Okay, so the last question comes from someone who is obviously a fan of your GFA imitation show. And it goes, can you please say the following sentence in Andres Segovia voice? Electric guitars are an abomination. Whoever heard of an electric violin, an electric cello, or for that matter, an electric singer? Oh my God. I mean, I, unfortunately, I can't stand up and do it with the, you know, because when I imitate Segovia, I pull my pants up to hear, you know. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, okay, so no one's going to be uh, really insulted by this, right? Mm, of course not. Okay, okay, I have to channel my inner inner Segovia. Well, you know, before I do this, let me let me let me go get something to show you here. This is this is a good uh, a good. Take your time. Yeah. No. Here we go. Oh, I cannot see you anymore. Just maybe if you can turn on the video, it will be great. I will. Perfect. Ah, yes, okay, so your masterclass is... with Segovia. I read about this. Yeah, this is 1981. There's me with, with Segovia. Just after Toronto competition, yeah. right? You had that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, okay, here goes. Electric guitars are an abomination. Whoever heard of electric violin, electric cello, or for that matter, an electric singer? Okay, so Bravo. people Thank are gonna be much. people are gonna be you know so mad at me for that. And, and I thought it would. That's what he he would always say to everybody when they played. He would always say, "It's too fast. It's too fast." <laughs> Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, William. What an inspiring conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it as well as I'm sure our listeners have. And now a huge thank you to you, our listeners. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope you join me in the next one. You can find a wide variety of performance videos as well as interactive tutorials by William Kennegeiser on guitarbymasters.com as well as hundreds of other videos and tutorials that will help you bring your guitar playing to the next level. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast as well as our YouTube channel. And if you want even more exclusive content, please join our newsletter. I hope you have a lovely week and join us in our next episode. Bye.